When I was asked four years ago to become president, I hadn't really taken into account the fact that I'd have to do this lecture, and actually, probably of all the things I've had to do, this race as, as one of the most challenging. But I hope you'll be kind to me on this very, very hot day. So uh, let's just start by um, saying something about my choice of subject. If we focus first on the first two terms, standards and norms, there's been a striking revival in interest in standardisation in the last few years. Since 2010, standardisation and destandardisation, since 2010 there's been a whole series of volumes both on contemporary, looking at standardisation in a contemporary and indeed in a historical way. And many of these have shared the belief which was first articulated by Jesperson in 1925, that, to quote him, is that the, the rise of standard languages is the greatest and most important phenomenon of the evolution of languages in historic times. And you find this repeated, for example, by James Milroy in 2001, who speaks of speakers of languages like English, French and German um, living in standard language cultures. And so there's been lots of studies, too, of individual languages, of English, French, Polish, and Italian, and I know of several other publications in preparation. Many of these have used um, as their model the so-called standard classic texts about standardization, and notably the work of the Norwegian-American Einar Haugen, his foundational essay in 1966, difficult to imagine, it was over 50 years ago, um, and a, no, a revised version in 87, and then two other major works I'm going to refer to quite a lot today, John Joseph's book, Eloquence and Power, and the Milroy's book um, on uh, authority and language. And I just put up the four covers because they show you how the publisher's view of authority and language has changed over the period. In thinking about standardisation, there have been a number of recurrent research questions, and some of these, of course, I'm going to try and address myself today. How do we best conceptualise or theorise standardisation of languages? How do we best model the processes involved in standardisation, and how adequate are existing models which have been used for many studies uh, of European languages. And can we begin to make generalizations about the standardization of languages across different geographical and time periods? Or to use John Joseph's phrase, can we do comparative standardology, an approach which is as yet relatively undeveloped? On the one hand, then, this is quite a topical question there's a lot of thinking about standards because they relate to education, but they relate to very topical questions like social integration and immigration. And the question, of course, has again become current with the key stage two tests, and you're getting headings like this, uh, pity our children, they're being turned into grammar robots at school. But there's also new considerations from a linguistic point of view, that is, in a postmodern world with greater democratisation and social change, is the role of standard languages weakening? Is the boundary between standard and non-standard becoming less well-defined? Standard language ideology has often been associated with nationalist aspirations. If we think of them as to being typical of the late 18th century, early 19th century, is that kind of ideology and the correctness <coughs> ideology associated with it weakening? On the other hand, of course, there's a very long history of thinking about norms and authority, which dates back at least to Quintilian. And Quintilian wrote in the first century AD already that language is based on reason, by which he means either etymology or analogy, antiquity, authority, the authority of good authors and good orators, and usage. And usage, he says, is the surest pilot in speaking. 
But already in Quintilian, we get that slip from usage to good usage. And these are terms which are going to recur in the early modern te texts I'm going to look at with you later. So we can see then that he defines usage as the speech of the agreed practice of educated men and says it can't be the usage of the majority. What then about my third term? To coin a well-known song, and then I go and spoil it all by saying something stupid like prescriptivism. Is prescriptivism a proper subject for a talk at the Philological Society? Indeed, is prescriptivism even part of linguistics? Well, if we listen to Trench in his lecture to the Philsoc in November 57, 1857, on some deficiencies in our English dictionaries, Trench definitely seemed to think no. In describing the deficiencies of existing dictionaries, Trench elaborated on the ideal of a lexicographer and wrote, a dictionary is an inventory of the language. It's no task of the maker of it to select the good words of a language. He's a historian, not a critic. And indeed, he says, he contrasts what he's trying to do with the French Academy Dictionary, which was about standardisation. And yet, for all Trench's protestations, of course, the OED has come to be viewed as an authority and indeed often used prescriptively. As Anne Curzon writes, no matter how hard contemporary lexicographers may protest that their work is descriptive, no matter what the prefaces of contemporary dictionaries say about their role in tracking language change and actual usage, users and reviewers still tend to see dictionaries as largely prescriptive. Now, if Trench wasn't very keen on it, then Trask is even more acerbic in his work on key co concepts in language and linguistics. Note that in this work, and like in, in many dictionaries and handbooks of linguistics, there's a simple dichotomy made between description and prescription, and that's something I'm going to come back to later and unpick a bit. He writes, the policy of describing languages, descriptivism is the policy of languages as they're found to exist. A prominent feature of traditional grammar is the frequent presence of prescriptivism. Excepting only in certain educational contexts, modern linguists utterly reject prescriptivism, and their investigations are based upon descriptivism. Descriptivism is a central tenet of what we regard as a scientific approach to the study of language. The very first requirement in any scholarly investigation is to get the facts right. Prescriptivism, in great contrast, is not a scientific approach. So perhaps my lecture isn't going to be as long as Trench's, which lasted over two sessions. Perhaps my lecture will be really quite short, because prescriptivism isn't part of what I should be talking about at all. Well, I can begin to answer, answer this perhaps in two ways. And the first thing we might say is that it's long been noted by people that if we're going to have a rounded no notion of the nature of language, we can't overlook its social functions and characteristics which include understanding standardisation, questions of prestige, attitudes to language, and what Debbie Cameron has called verbal hygiene. Or to cite Suzanne Romain, language is both a historical and social product, and therefore must be explained with reference to the historical and social forces which have shaped it. Secondly, and perhaps more controversially, a number of scholars, and most, most recently, uh, Armstrong and Mackenzie in a 2013 book have pointed out the covert ideological influence of the standard on much linguistic thinking and that linguistic theory has often assumed the properties of standardised varieties. So if we go back to Trask's definition, the first line, the policy of describing languages as they are found to exist... Gall has pointed out that it's the standard language ideology, as invented in Europe, which assumes that languages are nameable, countable, bounded, and differing from each other, which allow us to say that there are 24 languages of the EU. But this isn't true, as we know, of many parts of the world. For example, languages of the Pacific area, and perhaps not even true for certain parts of Europe. It's standard or near standard languages which have provided the model for structuralist views of language as self-contained systems. 
Now, I don't want to dwell on this point today because it's not the, 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 the force of my talk, but perhaps just to mention, for example, that grammaticality judgments in generative linguistics could be seen perhaps as a projection of standardization. Or in sociolinguistics, the fact that we talk about standard prestige or careful style as the unmarked rather than the marked form. So in talking about English, we talk about copular deletion rather than copular insertion. Or the fact that the notion of prestige in Lebovian sociolinguistics is closely related to standards of scales of standard and non-standard. Or that in traditional accounts of the history of ma ma major Western languages, we assume homogeneity and uh, association often with nation state. And they've been subject to what Urban and Gall have called erasure, whereby facts which are inconsistent with ideological schemes either go unnoticed or explained away. So this is what I want to try and do today. I want to start by distinguishing and discussing the processes of how we can model standardization. And I want to try and distinguish language standardization, creating standard languages, on the one hand, from the emergence of language standards or language norms, and on the other hand, from the process of de-standardization and re-standardization. So some people say the models of standardization aren't adequate because they don't take account of de-standardization. I'm going to argue that these are different processes. Then I want to zoom in actually on standardization in the narrower sense and look at the existing models and to see how effective they are. And I'm going to focus entirely on the processes today and not think about the historical and ideological questions associated with them, important though they are. And in thinking about those models, I'm going to again zoom in and think about the place of codification, prescription and purism within them. And then I want to come back to thinking about the validity of the descriptive, prescriptive dichotomy through a number of case studies looking at prescription in three uh, different languages. So then before I come to thinking about Halgan's model, I want to think about what might happen before we get to that point. And I think here the distinction made by John Joseph between language standards and standard languages is helpful. Language standards then are subconscious and he says it seems to be a trait of the species that once people become aware of variants in any area of behaviour, they evaluate them and that's how standards come into being. And he says that just as no human speech community exists without variation, there's not any speech community whose members are not consciously sensitive to language quality in one form or another. So we're making a distinction here between language standards, which is maybe a universal and very natural process, and the creation of standard languages, which is spread by cultural tradition and is underpinned by a certain ideology. So we could argue that just as variation opens up the process, the, the, the possibility of change, so Variation also opens up the potential for value-based discrimination. How can we then think about language standards? What would be the way of thinking about how language norms are formed rather than standard languages? And I think here it might be useful to refer to Bob LePage's work, um, which grew out of his work with Tabaret Keller and Acts of Identity, and LePage produced uh, in 88 an, art argument, an article uh, on standardization. And the basis of it is well known that we identify um, with patterns of verb behavior to try and resemble the groups we want to, and we distinguish our language from the groups we want to distance ourselves from. LePage continues that, that we could invoke the concepts of projection and focusing to understand how what he calls language standardization, but what I'm going to call the emergence of language standards, um, evolve. So he writes, um, linguistic activity is a process of projecting onto others images of the universe as we perceive it, and by implication inviting others to share our symbolization. 
If we feel that those we're speaking to are part of a group we wish to identify with, we may modify our behaviour so as to become more like our perceptive theirs. In that case, the behaviour of the group will become more focused. And since our symbolisation centres on the characteristics with which we've endowed groups, which we imagine we perceive in society, our own behaviour too will then, in that particular respect, become more focused, more regular. So this creation of norms, this sort of language standards, is a largely subconscious, unconscious process and can take place simultaneously around a number of norms. But standardisation, the formal thing, is, comes through reification, institutionalisation, totemization. So we might think then that this focusing and projection are fairly, may even be sociolinguistic universals, whereas of course codification, prescription are not. They're, that's a cultural invention and underpinned by a standard language ideology. So language norms or language standards, the process of standardisation, which I'm going to come back to, and then what next? Well, we can have destandardization and re-standardisation. And Christensen has argued that with the increasing anti-authoritarian, individualistic and democratic ideology that he argues characterises late modernity, standard language is replaced by language standards. So we're going back from the language standards, standard languages, language standards. And in doing that, he di distinguishes two different processes. Destandardization, where the established standard loses its position as the best language, and there's a sort of value levelling, a radical weakening of the ideology of the standard, and indeed it might even, he argued, lead to the death of the ideology of the standard. And on the other hand, dematisation, sometimes called re-standardisation, where the idea of the ideology of the standard stays intact, there's still a belief that there's a best language, that there's right and wrong, but the idea of what that best language changes. So it's what he calls revalorization, ideological upgrading, so low status languages becoming best language status. And we can see that this process might even be happening in a country like France, or for a language like French, which is one of the most highly standardised languages in the world, where on the one hand we're beginning to see the revalorization of regional varieties and, reach and, and um, new urban vernaculars becoming more, uh, having greater value, and on the other hand we can see the creation of pluricentric standards and the increasing value given to Canadian French, Belgian French and so on. So that might give us a model, something like this, where we start off with the language standards through the projection and focusing process. We have this more formal part of, it, of, of the thing, which I'm going to focus in on the rest of my talk, the standardisation. And then we go back through destandardisation, demotization, back to having language standards. And it, it's not necessary that you have to go through all those stages, and some languages won't go very far. Um, or perhaps you, people will tell me not at all. But there does seem to be something about the emergence of norms in, in most languages. So, for the rest of my talk, as, as I've said, sorry, I'm doing something. I'm going to. Um, I'm going to focus on how uh, on 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 the, on the formal standardisation part, and I'm going to start by looking at Haugen's model, which you can see from the slide has been used for a whole range of uh, counts uh, of lots of Western languages. It's comprised essentially of four processes. The selection of the norm, you have to select the basis of the norm. Codification, that is the form or has to be uh, codified, it's linguistic structure codified, the aim of which is to give minimal variation in form. We then have elaboration of function, and where you're trying to get maximal variation in function, enabling the language to fulfil all the roles it needs to all its communicative functions. And then for a language to become a standard, it has to be accepted by the community, 
it may just be actually be a small but powerful group, but then there has to be some diffusion or acceptance. Now, the model has been used a lot, I think, because of its um, simplicity and clarity. Having just four processes is quite neat. Um, conversely, then, it's being, it's being criticised for not being exhaustive. I've presented these, I said first, second, third, fourth, but in fact, Haugen uh, underlines the fact that these are not intended to be read as successive stages, but they may be um, simultaneous or even cyclical. But there is nevertheless a certain teleology with the model, and there actually there's a certain teleology with all modern accounts of standardization. If we think then of what I'm interested in here today, codification, prescription, and I'll adding in this third term, purism, we can see that in this model, we just get codification. We only get one of those terms. And the same is true of the revised model version of Halgan's model, where he splits down codification, you can see, into three sub-processes, graphization, creation of writing systems, uh, grammaticalation, writing of grammars, and lexicalation, the uh, selection of the appropriate lexicon. Actually, the term grammatisation, grammatisation has been picked up in the French school to be used more widely to cover all kinds of creation of metalinguistic texts, both grammars and dictionaries, and I'm going to use that definition a bit later. In these models, then, it seems to be, or at least in Haugen, it seems to be that codification and prescription are more or less equated. Haugen writes, the typical product of codification has been a prescriptive orthography, grammar, and dictionary. And you can find such accounts elsewhere. Costa Carreras writes that codification is equivalent to selecting the, establishing the selective norm as the prescriptive norm. In the Milroy's model, however, they do separate out codification and prescription as separate processes. Once again, they stress that these are not, uh, these are only hypothetical sages, and yet they also seem to say at the end, if it were a little quote at the end, that prescription tends to follow uh, codification. So can we make a distinction, on the first of all, then, between codification and prescription? Well, I would think, I'd like to argue that we can. Of these terms, codification is the one that's probably received the least attention. But I would like to think of codification simply as equivalent to Oru's term of grammatization. That is the creation, the production of grammars, dictionaries, or indeed any metalinguistic work. And then metalinguistic texts can be described as being either descriptive or prescriptive in character. Descriptive norm then is simply recording what is normal, regular, or frequent in language, no value judgment, whereas the prescriptive norm, of course, adds in a question of right, wrong, correct, incorrect. The prescriptive norm is typically then based on the descriptive norm, but simply adds in this conscious value judgment. Some people have argued actually, and, and uh, Trask um, in his definition of prescriptivism says that uh, prescriptivism often acts in defiance of normal usage, but most of, or much of it, um, will build on a descriptive norm. Now, because I'm absolutely incompetent and um, visually um, illiterate, I have set this out as a two-way path. But, of course, what I'm going to argue is that these, this is not at all a simple dichotomy and that we're going to think, have to think much more of it being um, a Klein or a continuum. Oops. Is there good and bad pres prescriptivism? Well, some people just think that prescriptivism is, is bad, full stop. Um, Deborah Cameron has written about it 
but it represents the threatening other, the forbidden. It's a spectre that haunts linguistics. And even Trust says, well, it's okay in education, I suppose, but the problem is many prescriptivists just go too far. Anne Curzon um, distinguishes different types of prescriptivism, one of which she calls politically responsive prescriptivism. These are guidelines from the society's publisher, Wiley. They're about non-sexist language. They, have, they are extremely prescriptive. They have all the devices that prescriptive works have. They say, use this, not this. They even have ticks and crosses. So you have, don't say, any observer of changes in publishing technology will perceive that he has need of. You must say observers of changes in publishing technology will perceive that they have. So this is all about gender-neutral language, non-sexist language. This is very prescriptive. This is how prescriptives tell us to write in all sorts of ways. Is this good or is this bad? Well, I think probably as a society, we're quite happy to have these as our guidelines for how we should publish. So I've talked a bit about codification and prescription, but I've snuck in another term, which is purism. Where does that fit into it? Thomas and Fanden Buscher, who did a big study of standardisation of Germanic languages, noted that lots of people had talked about purism, but never really said very much about what it was, and that this needed much more attention. Just as we've seen codification and prescription are often used interchangeably, the same is true of prescription and purism. So here is an example from Rousseau, who says that prescriptivism imposes the objective of preserving the purity of the language. On the whole, if we look in the literature, we tend to find two main types of definition of purism, what we might think of as the narrower definition, which is simply about keeping out the foreign, and then a broader definition of purism, which wants to protect the language from all sorts of contamination, in, in big inverted commas, which can be foreign borrowings, but it can be things coming from variation of change, anything considered deviant or impure. Thomas, in fact, concludes that purism is part of the standardisation process and tries to distinguish different types. Um, he talks about there being elitist purism, reformist purism, and xenophobic purism, which, of course, is the narrower type. So can we distinguish prescription and purism? Well, there haven't been many attempts to do this, but um, Pavel and, and, and Rosier have argued that purism brings in, if you look at the end at the bottom here, a kind of polemical dimension, an affective or an emotional dimension. It brings in notions of nostalgia, regret, combat and censure. In her work on purism, Liv Walsh has argued that um, codification, prescription um, and purism probably all have in common the, this first point, the idea that one form of the language is correct. But that purism adds in these other notions that the language is currently pure and therefore to change it will be to contaminate, corrupt, or some kind of decline, and that you have to protect language from it by either removing what is corrupt or stopping it coming in. So going back to my very, very, very schematic diagram, we might say then that codification sets out the rules for uh, language and can be either descriptive or prescriptive, Prescriptionism and purism both introduce a notion of correctness and right and wrong, but then purism adds in this other la layer that the language shouldn't change, that it needs to be protected, and that any change will be for the worse. 
One of the good things about Thomas's model is that he tries to talk about a scale of intensity for purism. So he differentiates between what he calls mild purism, where other factors are taken into account, moderate purism, which gives some concessions to other factors, and extreme purism, which simply ignores them. And I think perhaps in, in looking at how prescriptive a text is, that might also be a good idea to think about relative weights of these different factors I've talked about. And as I've said, I'm going to try and argue that description and prescription should be better seen as a, a Klein, or we should use a scale of intensity, so that we're going to talk about works and authors as being more or less, or more mildly purist or mildly um, prescriptive, rather than simply a black and white dichotomy. Finally, I wanted, before I get on to the, the case studies, I wanted to think that there might be at least different areas of prescriptivism in which we might want to distinguish when we think about analysing a work. So is it to do with the author's intention, either explicit or not? Is it to do with the way they express the ideas, or is it to do with the effect they have? So, intention, did they set out to be prescriptive? Um, interesting that very often with prescriptive works, people just get as far as reading the preface or the introduction. Uh, we'll see that lots of the texts I'm going to talk about, people have said these are works to far more cited in histories of language than read. Um, so we need to distinguish between explicit intentions, covert intentions, intended aims, and so on. And then we need to look at, unpick a bit the meta-language that's used, because again, works are often judged simply on the meta-language they use. But I want to think about whether the prescriptive language reflects indeed a prescriptive attitude, or whether it is trying to capture a dominant usage, or give guidance about changing usage, or to tell us something about different social or stylistic values. Convert oops, sorry. Conversely, when we're thinking about descriptive texts and descriptive meta-language, does that reflect a descriptive attitude, or might there be some covert prescriptivism hiding beneath it? And then when we think about the effect of the prescriptive, prescriptive texts, does this come from the original text? Does it come from later versions of that text? One thing that often happens with texts, particularly these, these standard grammars I'm going to look at, they, they get put into different kinds of works, school grammars, and people get the image of the text from the later versions rather than from the original. Or is it to do with, so is it to do with later perceptions, or is it the way, the way people use the text? So the fact that people use the OED as a prescriptive text, although that wasn't what wasn't what was or perhaps is intended. So then now what I want to do is to take some examples from three different traditions and try and see if we can look at these texts using this more refined way and trying to build, break down intention, language and effect. Those of you who know my work will know that um, I can't um, give a talk without talking about um, Wojler, who is the author of a famous uh, set of remarks on the French language published in the 17th century, middle of the 17th century. And you can see he falls into the camp of prescriptive purism. Then I'm going to talk about, um, give some examples from uh, Robert Louth, his grammar, which is um, some... Uh, hundred years later, um, Melvin Bragg, David Crystal, Bill Browserson all call him an icon of prescriptivism. Um, and it's an interesting work because you can see almost visually that the top half is more or less descriptive and the notes where he talks about what's right and wrong are more or less prescriptive. So you have a real physical view of the descriptive and prescriptive coming together. And then my example, third lot of examples will come from uh, Chatelius and his grammar in the mid-17th century, detailed account of the standard German language, 
and, and analysed by Nicola McClelland and others. And again, we're going to see that these categories of prescriptive intent and expression uh, we can use, I think, usefully to understand a bit more about them. The first thing I'd like to say then is that all of them show some sensitivity to variation. So here are a couple of examples from the French tradition where you have, should I say sur les armes or sous les armes, and Vosges says it doesn't matter, use both. Or on the case of il n'y a rien de tel, il n'y a rien de tel, there's uh, nothing like it. Again, he says they're both fine. Actually, one's better for speaking and one's better for writing. And that opens up a whole big question, which I'm not going to talk about today, which is whether the standard really only applies to written language or spoken language as well. But certainly in his model, uh, speech is included. In Louth too, then, we find the variability of usage. Louth, uh, and I went, was in a conference last week where um, Louth once more was attributed for being the person who uh, stopped preposition stranding. He's the bad guy who's told us we can't do it anymore. But actually, if you read what he says, he says, it's an idiom which prevails in common conversation and suits very well with familiar style. He just doesn't want to use it in solemn and elevated writing. And note the purest joke. He says, this is an idiom which our language is strongly inclined to. So he's putting the two in the wrong place. In Chatelius, we find the same sorts of things. So if we start looking at intention, we again begin to find a mixed picture. So Vaugelard writes for, on the one hand, that he is simply what he calls himself as a simple observer, um, that he's recording usage, it's not laws, and that he didn't want to get any sense that he was trying to impose things which he was only trying to record. And indeed, there are two very interesting methodological in, uh, observations in this volume where he talks about how do you find out what to, what to say if usage is doubtful. And he says you have to get um, naive informants, you have to frame the questions so they don't know what you're talking about. Indeed, he has an early idea of trying to avoid the observer's paradox. And yet, of course, there is also the slippage from usage to good usage. Just as we saw with Quintilian, Bad usage comprises the majority of people. Good usage is a plurality of voices, um, not a plurality of voices, but of the elite. So that the explicit statements um, are very mixed. But certainly in all of these texts, we can find evidence of comments where the, word, the, the expression is prescriptive and the behaviour is prescriptive and the intention is prescriptive. Here's an example from the French tradition where he asks, should you say le revoir and organons? And so this is co coordinated verbs, an object pronoun. Should you repeat the object pronoun before it or not? Pour le revoir et augmenté or pour le revoir et l'augmenté. And he very prescriptively says, uh, it's not the pure right way to write, it's a rule without exception. Well, it's clearly not. We can see many, many, many examples before and after of this construction, and indeed, Vaugelas himself uses it. So here he is being absolutely prescriptive. The same is also true of Louth and Chatelius. I'll give the example here now from Chatelius. Chatelius, for example, prefers dies rather than dies this rather than these as the form of the demonstrative this, although we know it was strongly disfavoured already at that time of writing. So he's going against normal, frequent, current and prescribing uh, what he prefers. Now what about prescriptive in expression? So here is another prescriptive comment from Vaugelas. He's talking about 
the past historic, the preterite form for the verb prendre, which is the verb to take. Should it be prendre, prendre, prendre? No, he says. They are worthless. They're used for acceptable, but no good. Uh, you can only now use pre and prea. If we look then at usage, this is based on a large uh, corpora of French texts. And for the 17th century, there's over 24 million words, which of course allows us to see things which we could only intuit before. We can see that actually, Vaugelas more or less got it right. This is the decade he's writing in. These are the two he favours. This is the one he says is the recent loss. So he was very prescriptive in his expression, but actually, in the decade he was writing, he was recording usage. Here's another example. This is the verb to become, and it's an observation about whether you should say commencer à, to begin to, or commencer de, should it be à or de. Again, very, very prescriptive language. Always requires the preposition à. You must say, it's got all the, tra the, the, the trimmings of prescriptivism, only à is acceptable. So he's prescriptive here, right? Well, he certainly is, isn't he? Because his followers all say he's wrong. Menage says, no, we use both. Bohr says, no, we use both. And indeed, the French Academy, that very tolerant institution, says we use both. And, whoops. But here again, if we look at some statistics, again, it looks a bit less clear. So if we look at the decades 16, 10, 16, 19, commencer de seems to have been very, very fashionable. But gradually, commencer à begins to become more and more fashionable. And so in the decade that Vaugelas is writing, it's 11 times more common. So he's picked up the fact that there's been a change of, of, of the dominant variant and gone for this one. Later on, of course, they, the, the, the preponderance actually decreases a bit, although commencer à still remains about five times more common. So although he looks very prescriptive, he was recording what was normal, frequent, dominant, at least when he was writing. And we can find the same for other traditions. I'm conscious that time's going, so I'll skip over now for the Louth example um, and mention, that, again, the Chatelius one, which is looking at the spelling of um, words like unt and unza, should it be u or v. Um, in the 16th century bond corpus, v is clearly dominant. It occurs about 90% of the time. By the second half of the century, in the German C corpus, covering eight genres and five regions, V has gone down to 19%. So by the time Chatelius was writing in the middle of the following century, maybe he didn't get it wrong. Maybe that was this frequent one, rather than being completely uh, imposed. And then I want to say finally something about prescriptive in effect. Um, and I've made the point that sometimes works appear in different types and they come to be, it seem much more prescriptive than they were originally. And here's an example. Oops, no. um, here's an example where um, Vaugelas is writing about the noun vitupère, which means blame. And he says blame is hardly acceptable, although it was used in one of his authority, two of his authorities. I would use it in jest and in low style. Very quickly, these observations get put into compilations and all the ifs and buts are stripped away. Vaugelas contended vitupé. But he didn't. He just said, I would only use it in certain contexts. And that's, again, a very typical thing. The same happens, for example, with the negative, which I won't talk about now. 
And we can find similar examples in the English tradition. This is um, the example of the double negative. And again, Louth is usually blamed as the person who stopped the use of the double negative. But actually what Louth says is, two negatives in English destroy one another or are equivalent to an affirmative. It's actually Lindley Murray who is typically held up as the good guy, as a descriptivist, versus the bad guy, Louth, who adds in, it's better. And in fact, again, if um, studies by people like Tikhon Boon and um, Nebelainen and Ramal in Bromberg have shown that by the end of the 17th century, double negatives were also already in um, rapid uh, decline. How am I doing for time? Okay. Um, I would just wanted to say as an aside um, that this mixture of descriptivism and prescriptivism is not just a feature of early modern texts. And I've taken another bad guy, Brian Garner, bad guy in that he's often been attacked by linguists like Jeff Pullum for um, writing this kind of usage guide, um, where he talks about himself as trying to uh, canvas, to leaven what he calls the prescriptive approach by canvassing uh, usage. And he describes himself as a descriptive prescriber. So prescription, the prescriptive norm based on the descriptive norm. And he says, um, he's, he's looked at the facts underpinning the judgments. I've taken a descriptivist tact of you of citing voluminous evidence, perhaps more than some readers might think necessary. And what he does is he has, when he's trying to decide whether a new word or a new expression is acceptable, he uses what he calls this language change index, which he bases, yeah, partly on his own sense. It's partly random. Of course it's partly random. But he also does extensive surveys in things like Google Books, Nexus, Oxford English Corpus, and so on, to look at word frequencies, and he asks a panel of critical readers about their preferences. So here, too, we're seeing this mixture of descriptivism and prescriptivism, which is absolutely typical of many works. So then to go back to thinking about my three key terms, and again, it's, it's still not very sophisticated or very visually appealing, I apologise for that. But we can begin to break down these things like prescriptivism into these subcategories, intention, expression, effect. And we could do the same for purism, and we could see how actually we could build up quite a complex network of interaction between these things, rather than having a simple black-white dichotomy. And then we might try and put this within my broader scheme, and I've just started to pick this apart here today, but picking apart all these as well, and probably picking these apart as well and trying to refine the model so we get to something which is more nuanced and more reflective of what we actually find in texts. Okay, so that brings me on to my conclusions then. I've argued that it's important to distinguish language standards and standard languages and that lots of the criticisms of models for standard languages are really criticisms which shouldn't be levelled at it. For example, that they don't account for destandardization. And I've argued that whereas language standards perhaps even occur universally, standard languages represent a Western concept associated with the ideology of the standard. I've argued then that the models such as standardised as, as Haugen's model are appropriate only for that narrower sense of the creation of standard languages, and that for thinking about the, the emergence of language norms, we might want to use rather the processes of projection and 
focusing. I've argued as well that Haugen's model is in need of refinement and adaptation. I focus, as I said, on codification, prescription and purism today, but we need to think about all the other processes in a similarly critical light. And then in thinking about prescription and purism, we need to break down what, think separately about what the intention is, whether it's explicit, implicit, or indeed covert. We need to think about where the prescriptive influence comes from. And we need to really be careful in just thinking that prescriptive meta-language necessarily means prescription and that it might actually reflect social or stylistic values, the attempt to record a dominant usage, or to chart the rise of a form rapidly spreading through usage. So the attitudes, behaviour and impact don't always coincide. Finally then, independent work on three grammatical traditions have come to the same conclusion that whenever these so-called prescriptive texts are examined in detail, the simple dichotomy between description and prescription becomes untenable. My study has shown, I hope, that it would be preferable to have a scale of intensity or to see description, prescription and purism as forming a continuum or climb rather than discrete categories. Nevertheless, of course, the three case studies I've given you today are all major Western languages. And we need to explore whether the same pertains for minoritised languages, and indeed to see whether there's scope to apply the model beyond the Western traditions for which it was designed and to which it's almost exclusively been applied. And that's probably the point to hand over to your expect expertise in lots of other languages to tell me about that. Thank you very much. Thank you.